This is a tribute to Dr. Benjamin Achik Machar, a lost boy turned PhD holder. On Saturday, the 7th of May, 2016, the South Sudanese community in Washington, D.C. celebrated yet another achievement by one of the lost boys of South Sudan in USA. Benjamin Achik Machar, one of the lost boys who was resettled to the U.S., has made South Sudan proud by concluding his postgraduate studies and earning himself a philosophy doctorate in political science from Howard University in Washington, D.C. after successfully defending his thesis on the state monopolization and discont discontentment in post-independent South Sudan, a deja vu all over again. Ambassador Grandi Ngakwong, Ambassador Bak Valentino Kalwol, Ambassador Munde Ngajuet, together with all diplomats, technical attaches and local staff at the Embassy of the Republic of South Sudan in Washington, D.C., congratulate Dr. Benjamin Ashik Machar for this great educational achievement. We congratulate the entire South Sudanese community and the community of Aliab in particular. We congratulate Dr. Benjamin and we wish him all the best in whatever he wants to do next. Following his arrival in USA in 2001 as a lost boy, Dr. Benjamin Sheikh Mashar embarked on educating himself through the most difficult of conditions in America and managed to graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree from Central Michigan University in 2007 and proceeded to do his Master's of Arts degree in 2009 from the same university. Dr. Benjamin Ashik Mashar is a young man, only 35 years old, and has already achieved so much. He hails from the Aliab community of Byung Payam in Eastern Lake State in the current Republic of South Sudan, specifically from Ramshell area, an area that is designated to be the new capital of South Sudan. His educational achievement is commendable and astonishing, not just because it is a success story of a lost boy, but because he is reported to be the first citizen of a Liab community ever to reach so high in educational achievement and earn himself a PhD. On the day of Dr. Benjamin Ashik Mashar graduation, he shared the same platform with Honorable Dr. Barack Hussein Obama the 44th President of the United States of America, as he humbly accepted the award of a honorary Doctor of Philosophy degree in science. It was a great day by all accounts, and Dr. Barack Hussein Obama, as Convocation Guest Speaker, delivered one of the best speeches of his time in office, and concluding by giving some sound advice and recommendations to the Rio graduates of class 2016 as follows. So with the rest of my time, I'd like to offer some suggestions for how young leaders like you can fulfill your destiny and shape our collective future. Bend it in the direction of justice and equality and freedom. First of all, and this should not be a problem for this group, be confident in your heritage. Be confident in your blackness. One of the great changes that's occurred in our country since I was your age is the realization there's no one way to be black. I take it from somebody who's seen both sides of the debate about whether I'm black or not. <laughs> past couple months, I've had lunch with the Queen of England and hosted Kendrick Lamar in the Oval Office. <laughs> there's no straitjacket, there's no constraints, there's no litmus test for authenticity. Look at Howard. One thing most folks don't know about Howard is how diverse it is. When you arrived here, some of you were like, oh, they got black people in Iowa? <laughs> but it's true. This class comes from big cities and rural communities and 
Some of you crossed oceans to study here. You shatter stereotypes. Some of you come from a long line of bison. Some of you are the first in your family to graduate from college. <laughs> you all talk different. You all dress different. You're Lakers fans, Celtics fans, maybe even some hockey fans. And because of those who come before you, you have models to follow. You can work for a company or start your own. You can go into politics or run an organization that holds politicians accountable. You can write a book that wins the National Book Award, or you can write the new run of Black Panther, or like one of your alumni, Tana Easy Coates, you can go ahead and just do both. You can create your own style, set your own standard of beauty, embrace your own sexuality. Think about an icon we just lost, Prince. He blew up categories. People didn't know what Prince was doing. And folks loved him for it. You need to have the same confidence. Or as my daughters tell me all the time, you be you, daddy. <laughs> Sometimes Sasha puts a variation on it. You do you, daddy. <laughs> and because you're a black person doing whatever it is that you're doing, that makes it a black thing. Feel confident. Second, even as we each embrace our own beautiful, unique, and valid versions of our blackness, remember the tie that does bind us as African Americans. And that is our particular awareness of injustice and unfairness and struggle. That means we cannot sleepwalk through life. We cannot be ignorant of history. We can't meet the world with a sense of entitlement. We can't walk by a homeless man without asking why a society as wealthy as ours allows that state of affairs to occur. We can't just lock up a low-level dealer without asking why this boy, barely out of childhood, felt he had no other options. We have cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters who we remember were just as smart and just as talented as we were, but somehow got ground down by structures that are unfair and unjust. And that means we have to not only question the world as it is and stand up for those African Americans who haven't been so lucky. Because yes, you've worked hard, but you've also been lucky. That's a pet peeve of mine. People who've been successful and don't realize they've been lucky. That God may have blessed them. It wasn't nothing you did. So, so don't have an attitude. But we must also expand our moral imaginations to understand and empathize with all people who are struggling. Not just black folks who are struggling. The refugee, the immigrant, the rural poor, the transgender person, and yes, the middle-aged white guy who may, you may think has all the advantages, but over the last several decades has seen his world upended by economic and cultural and technological change 
and feels powerless to stop it. You gotta get in his head too. Number three, you have to go through life with more than just passion for change. You need a strategy. I'll repeat that. I want you to have passion. You have to have a strategy. Not just awareness, but action. Not just hashtags, but votes. You see, change requires more than righteous anger. It requires a program and it requires organizing. At the 1964 Democratic Convention, Fannie Lou Hamer, five feet four inches tall, gave a fiery speech on the national stage. But then she went back home to Mississippi and organized cotton pickers. And she didn't have the tools and technology where you can whip up a movement in minutes. She had to go door to door. And I'm, I'm so proud of the new guard of black civil rights leaders who understand this. It's thanks in large part to the activism of young people like many of you, from black Twitter to Black Lives Matter, that America's eyes have been opened, white, black, Democrat, Republican, to the real problems, for example, in our criminal justice system. But to bring about structural change, lasting change, awareness is not enough. It requires changes in law, changes in custom. If you care about mass incarceration, let me ask you, how are you pressuring members of Congress to pass the criminal justice reform bill now pending before them. If you care about better policing, do you know who your district attorney is? Do you know who your state's attorney general is? Do you know the difference? Do you know who appoints the police chief and who writes the police training manual? Find out who they are, what their responsibilities are. Mobilize the community, present them with a plan, work with them to bring about change, hold them accountable if they do not deliver. Passion is vital, but you gotta have a strategy. And your plan better include voting. Not just some of the time, but all of the time. It is absolutely true that 50 years after the Voting Rights Act, there are still too many barriers in this country to vote. There are too many people trying to erect new barriers to voting. This is the only advanced democracy on earth that goes, goes out of its way to make it difficult for people to vote. And there's a reason for that. There's a legacy to that. But let me say this, even if we dismantled every barrier to voting, that alone would not change the fact that America has some of the lowest voting rates in the free world. In 2014, only 36 percent of Americans turned out to vote in the midterms, second lowest participation rate on record. You turn out, that would be you, was less than 20 percent. Less than 20 percent, four out of five, did not vote. In 2012, nearly two in three Americans, African Americans turned out. And then in 2014, only two in five turned out. You don't think that made a difference in terms of the Congress I've got to deal with? <laughs> and then people are wondering, well, well how, how come Obama hadn't gotten this done? How come he didn't get that done? You don't think that made a difference? What would have happened if you had turned out at 50, 60, 70 percent? all across this country. People try to make this political thing really complicated. They're like, well, what kinds of reforms do we need? And, and how do we need to do that? And what? You know what? Just vote. <laughs> it, it, it's math. 
If, if you have more votes than the other guy, you get to do what you want. It, it's not that complicated. And you don't have excuses. You don't have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar or bubbles on a bar of soap to register to vote. You don't have to risk your life to cast a ballot. Other people already did that for you. <laughs> your grandparents, your great-grandparents might be here today, they were working on it. What's your excuse? <laughs> when we don't vote, we give away our power. Disenfranchise ourselves right when we need to use the power that we have. Right when we need your power to stop others from taking away the vote and rights of those more vulnerable than you are, the elderly and the poor, the formerly incarcerated trying to earn their second chance. So you got to vote all the time, not just when it's cool, not just when it's time to elect a president, not just when you're inspired. It's your duty. When it's time to elect a member of Congress or a city councilman or a school board member or a sheriff, that's how we change our politics, by electing people at every level who are representative of and accountable to us. It is not that complicated. Don't make it complicated. And finally, change requires more than just speaking out. It requires listening as well. In particular, it requires listening to those with whom you disagree and being prepared to compromise. You know, when I was a state senator, I helped pass Illinois' first racial profiling law. And one of the first laws in the nation requiring the videotaping of confessions in capital cases. And we were successful because early on I engaged law enforcement. I didn't say to them, oh, there's this, you guys are so racist, I, you know, you need to do something. I understood, as many of you do, that the overwhelming majority of police officers are good and honest and courageous and fair and love the communities they serve. And we knew there were some bad apples and that even good cops with the best of intentions, including, by the way, African-American police officers might have unconscious biases, as we all do. So we engaged and we listened and we kept working until we built consensus. And because we took the time to listen, we crafted legislation that was good for the police because it improved the trust and cooperation of the community, and it was good for the communities who were less likely to be treated unfairly. And I can say this unequivocally. Without at least the acceptance of the police organizations in Illinois, I could never have gotten those bills passed. It's very simple. They would have blocked them. The point is, you need allies in a democracy. That's just the way it is. It can be frustrating and it can be slow. But history teaches us that the alternative to democracy is always worse. That's not just true in this country. It's not a black or white thing. Go to any country where the give and take of democracy has been repealed by one party rule and I will show you a country that does not work. And democracy requires compromise. Even when you are 100% right. This is hard to explain sometimes. You can be completely right and you still are going to have to engage folks who disagree with you. If you think that the only way forward is to be as uncompromising as possible, you will feel good about yourself. You will enjoy a certain moral purity, 
but you're not going to get what you want. And if you don't get what you want long enough, you will eventually think the whole system is rigged. And that will lead to more cynicism and less participation and a downward spiral of more injustice and more anger and more despair. And that's never been the source of our progress. That's how we cheat ourselves of progress. You know, we remember Dr. King's soaring orator. The power of his letter from a Birmingham jail. The marches he led, but he also sat down with President Johnson in the Oval Office to try and get a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act passed. And those two seminal bills were not perfect, just like the Emancipation Proclamation was a war document as much as it was some clarion call for freedom. Those mileposts of our progress were not perfect. They did not make up for centuries of slavery or Jim Crow or eliminate racism or provide for 40 acres and a mule. But they made things better. And you know what? I will take better every time. I always tell my staff, better is good. Because you consolidate your gains and then you move on to the next fight from a stronger position. Brittany Packman, a member of the Black Lives Matter movement and Campaign Zero, one of the Ferguson protest organizers, she joined our task force on 21st century policing. Some of her fellow activists questioned whether she should participate. She rolled up her sleeves. She sat at the same table with big city police chiefs and prosecutors. And because she did, she ended up shaping many of the recommendations of that task force. And those recommendations are now being adopted across the country. Changes that many of the protesters called for. If young activists like Brittany had refused to participate out of some sense of ideological purity, then those great ideas would have just remained ideas. But she did participate, and that's how change happens. America is big, and it is boisterous, and it is more diverse than ever. The President told me that we've got a, a, a significant uh, Nepalese contingent here at, at, at Howard. I would not have guessed that. Right on. <laughs> but it, it, it just tells you how, how interconnected we're becoming. And, and with so many folks from so many places converging, we are not always going to agree with each other. Another Howard alum, Zora Neale Hurston, once said, this is a good quote here, nothing that God ever made is the same thing to more than one person. Think about that. That's why our democracy gives us a process designed for us to settle our disputes with argument and ideas and votes instead of violence and simple majority rule. So don't try to shut folks out. Don't try to shut them down, no matter how much you might disagree with them. You know, there's been a trend around the country of, of trying to get colleges to disinvite speakers with a different point of view or disrupt a politician's rally. Don't, don't do that. No matter how ridiculous or offensive, you might find the things that come out of their mouths. Because as my grandmother used to tell me, every time a fool speaks, they are just advertising their own ignorance. <laughs> Let them talk. Let them talk. If you don't, you just make them a victim. And then they can avoid accountability. That doesn't mean you shouldn't challenge them. Have the confidence to challenge them. Confidence in the rightness of your position. There will be times when you shouldn't compromise your core values, your integrity. And you will have the responsibility to speak up in the face of injustice. But listen. 
engage. If the other side has a point, learn from them. If they're wrong, rebut them, teach them, beat them on the battlefield of ideas. And you might as well start practicing now because one thing I can guarantee you, you will have to deal with ignorance, hatred, racism, foolishness, trifling folks. <laughs> I promise you, you will have to deal with all that at every stage of your life. That may not seem fair, but life has never been completely fair. Nobody promised you a crystal stare. And if you want to make life fair, then you've got to start with the world as it is. So that's my advice. That's how you change things. Change isn't something that happens every four years or eight years. Change is not placing your faith in any particular politician and then just putting your feet up and saying, okay, go. <laughs> Change is the effort of committed citizens who hitch their wagons to something bigger than themselves and fight for it every single day. And that's what Thurgood Marshall understood. A man who once walked this yard, graduated from Howard Law, went home to Baltimore, started his own law practice. He and his mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston, rolled up their sleeves and they set out to overturn segregation. They worked through the NAACP, filed dozens of lawsuits, fought dozens of cases. And after nearly 20 years of effort, 20 years, Thurgood Marshall ultimately succeeded in bringing his righteous cause before the Supreme Court and securing the ruling in Brown versus Board of Education that separate could never be. 20 years. Marshall, Houston, they knew it would not be easy. They knew it would not be quick. They knew all sorts of obstacles would stand in their way. They knew that even if they won, that would just be the beginning of a longer march to equality. But they had discipline. They had persistence. They had faith and a sense of humor. And they made life better for all Americans. And I know you graduates share those qualities. I know it because I've learned about some of the young people graduating here today. They, there's a young woman named uh, Sierra Jefferson who's graduating with you. And I'm just going to use her as an example. I hope you don't mind Sierra. Sierra grew up in Detroit and was raised by a poor single mom who worked seven days a week in an auto plant. And for a time, her family found themselves without a place to call home. And they bounced around between friends and family who might take them in. By her senior year, Sierra was up at 5 a.m. every day juggling homework, extracurricular activities, volunteering, all while taking care of her little sister. But she knew that education was her ticket to a better life. So she never gave up, pushed herself to excel. This daughter of a single mom who works on the assembly line turned down a full scholarship to Harvard to come to Howard. And today, like many of you, Sarah's the first in her family to graduate from college. And then she says she's going to go back to her hometown, just like Thurgood Marshall did, to make sure all the working folks she grew up with have access to the health care they need and deserve. And she puts it, she's going to be a change agent. She's going to reach back and help folks like her succeed. And people like Sierra are why I remain optimistic about America. Young people like you are why I never give in to despair. James Baldwin once wrote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Graduates, each of us 
is only here because someone else faced down challenges for us. We are only who we are because someone else struggled and sacrificed for us. That's not just Thurgood Marshall's story or Sierra's story or my story or your story. That is the story of America. The story whispered by slaves in the cotton fields. The song of marches in Selma. The dream of a king in the shadow of Lincoln. The prayer of immigrants who set out for a new world. The roar of women demanding the vote. The rallying cry of workers who built America. And the GIs who bled overseas for our freedom. Now it's your turn. And the good news is you're ready. And when your journey seems too hard, and when you run into a chorus of cynics who tell you that you're being foolish to keep believing, or that you can't do something, or that you should just give up, or you should just settle, you might say to yourself a little phrase that I have found handy these last eight years. Yes, we can. Congratulations, class of 2016. Good luck. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. I'm proud of you. Many foreigners, including Europeans and Chinese, plus several South Sudanese from different walks of life and regions and ethnic backgrounds, attended the graduation ceremony of Dr. Benjamin Hachik Machar at Howard University in the morning of Saturday, the 7th of May, 2016. And many more attended a special lunch organized in his honor at the local restaurant, Ethiopian restaurant, in the state of Virginia in the afternoon. What I have observed during the lunch is that all those who spoke about Dr. Benjamin Ashik Mashar at the restaurant described him candidly using some very few words but meaning, meaningful words. Some said he is a very kind young man, others said he is unassuming, polite, adaptable and a resilient man. Others said he's a simple man and a trustworthy man. Others said the guy is possible, he's honest, he's straightforward. Somebody else said he was helpful and determined and task driven. And someone else said he is politically astute and he is committed to his people and to the Republic of South Sudan. These few examples of how people describe him, plus many other positive attributes, all of which, in my opinion, allowed Dr. Benjamin Ashik Mashar to chart his way into success. In conclusion, I want to congratulate Dr. Benjamin Ashik Mashar once more and to tell him, well done, we are proud of you and you have made South Sudan 
proud. You have made the community of Aliyap very proud. And we wish you all the best. We pray for your success in life going forward. Good luck. Celebrate